Hello, and welcome to Beyond Consulting, brought to you by ECA Partners, the only podcast dedicated to helping you navigate your career after consulting. I'm Ken Canera, host of Beyond Consulting and CEO of ECA Partners, a specialized project staffing and executive search firm focused on former management consultants and private equity. Each week, I get to host guests that have successfully transitioned out of consulting and gone on to do more interesting things with their career. This week, I'd like to welcome Gavin Edgley to the studio. Gavin is the Senior Director of Value Acceleration at Databricks. Gavin, thanks so much for joining. Of course. Cheers, Ken. Thanks for having me. You bet. So, Gavin, we usually like to start off with just a little bit of background uh, from our guests. I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your career uh, and and kind of what got you here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can probably tell from the accent that I'm not native to the States. So I'd started my career out in, in Australia, started as a management consultant and worked at a couple of different firms before finally making the, the big switch and coming across to the States, which has led me to MuleSoft and now uh, the current role at Databricks that you called out in the intro. So yeah, happy to go into a bit more detail, but it's been an interesting ride so far. Hopefully something helpful for folks that are kind of planning out their next steps after after consulting. Absolutely. And Gavin, you already win the award for having the most mellifluous uh, sounding voice of, of, of all our guests. <laughs> I apologize to past guests that can't compete uh, with, with his accent. But um, <laughs> why don't we start with Databricks? First of all, what is Databricks? What do you all do? And, and then curious to dive into your role. Yeah, for sure. So Databricks is the data and AI company, essentially. That's the, the way that we, we position ourselves. We help you know data scientists, data engineers, data analysts to solve the world's toughest problems with, with their data. So some folks know this company because of the, the co-founding team. There are a great bunch of folks from, from Berkeley that pioneered some really innovative technology like Spark and Delta Lake. And since then, the company has really grown to the point now where we have 3,000 employees. We have a fantastic $38 billion valuation um, we have the, the support and investment of each of the large cloud providers as well as Salesforce. So it's, it's quite a kind of force for change and innovation in the AI space, in the data and AI space. And we help companies large and small with yeah, to solve those, those really tough problems. Could you maybe give an example just for our listeners that don't quite understand what that means? Yeah, of course. So this, I, I mean, I always used to get this question in consulting, like, how do you explain your job when you're at a, at a barbecue? It was always really hard. It's easier now I'm at Databricks. If you watch Disney Plus, for example, uh, you're watching watching a show and you'll finish it up. There'll be a recommendation at the end, a couple of recommendations as to what you should watch next. All of those recommendations are powered by Databricks. And so what's happening behind the scenes there is they understand you know, the way that users interact with their platform, they understand preferences, and then they, they are able to make recommendations that are most going to be attuned to your tastes. So yeah, all of that's powered by Databricks. Excellent. And so is it almost exclusively or is it exclusively B2B? Yes. Exclu- oh, well, there's, a, there's an investment in the, the education side of things. So it's really important for the, for the you know, next wave of users to feel really comfortable with, with our platform. So universities and, uh, and individuals can actually use the, the software. There's a you know, free to use version which can get you started. But the, in terms of the you know, commercial focus of, of Databricks, it's very much business to business. And we cover all segments. We cover the, the top end of town, the, the huge companies like Walgreens and, and Disney, right down to some of the small innovative startups here in the Bay Area as well. Excellent. And do you think about breaking that up into different sectors or industries, or do you think about it from a solutioning perspective? How do you think about that? We do. So Databricks is going through a lot of change. I've been at Databricks now for, for nearly three years. And uh, you know, when I joined, it was just a couple of hundred folks. Now there's 3,000, and there's been a lot of change throughout that period, including a shift in our focus and the way that we go to market towards verticalization. Um, so we've broken out our first verticals, and we tailor the messaging and our approach based on the specific needs of those verticals. So in, in short, yes, it, I think it's really important. If you're a you know data scientist working in healthcare versus a data scientist working in retail, you speak a different language. And so it's fortunate that Databricks is now at the scale that we can kind of meet the needs of those different groups and, and tailor the approach. Excellent. And what about your role? What, what is it exactly that you do and how has that evolved since joining? Yeah, the role that I play is myself and my team, we help to tell the story of the impact that companies can make with data and AI. So we quantify the impact that's made. We uh, basically make our, make our customers an absolute hero in the process. And typically the, the work that we do to create you know, an executive ready piece of communication to celebrate the successes of these teams and, and uh, you know, piece it all together, typically that's involved that we use that most either 
as customers are running with our software and they're looking to you know expand the influence of their data and AI practice, or alternately, they're just getting started and they want to help justify the investment. So the, the value acceleration team uh, is essentially a, an extension of the, the field sales organization. So Databricks has a you know, few hundred account executives and really, really proficient technical folks that partner together with them in order to make our customers successful. We come in as you know, specialized people that can bring a, a unique set of skills, often from uh, our consulting background, to help you know, modeling, you know, quantify, pull together an executive ready story, and then help our account executives and those account teams to present it to the right folks. Is it okay for me to kind of think of value acceleration as similar to customer success? And if so, or if not, how is it different? It's a bit different. So we partner with with customer success. There's a few ways to think about this. I, I can see why you would, you would link it through to customer success. At Databricks, at least, customer success is, is often more technical. So our customer success engineers will be able to uh, help with, you know, high level architectural issues. They'll be able to help problem solve on specific challenges the customer might be facing. Our role is, is slightly different in that we would we make the connection between the technology that's that's being used and the impact that it drives for the business. So our work our work typically involves understanding the strategic objectives of a company, uh, you know, connecting with a very senior executive audience, often the, an audience that's less technical, and then helping them to to build a case for change. And so that's I'd say the customer success folks pick pick up that story and actually use it to help guide the way that they then interact with customers. But yeah, it's slightly different if that helps. It does. It does. It sounds like this you have to understand a, a lot of the more the the business side of things uh, versus the technical side of things. Definitely. Okay, got it. That that makes a lot of sense. And then I guess have you have you always worked on value acceleration since joining Databricks, or is, it, or is that evolved? I have, I have since when I when I joined, I was the the first member of the team under the the global VP. Now there are fifteen of us globally, seven in my team here in the US. So a, a pretty quick growth trajectory over the last couple of years, and of course plans for that growth trajectory to continue. We're pretty fortunate. Over the last twelve months, the plan was to double the size of the business in terms of the number of people. And we're pretty much doubling revenue as well. So the growth rate is, is is insane. And we're kind of racing towards the, you know, first billion in revenue. It's an exciting journey. And and our team is kind of central to a lot of those, especially the bigger deals that are that are pushing forward. And so it's important and Databricks kind of recognizes the need to invest in this team as the company grows. Excellent. And speaking of growth, you mentioned clients like Disney Plus or something like that. Where are you seeing a lot of the growth happen? Is it in company like certain company sizes and certain sectors what does that look like it's an interesting one it's kind of tough to pin down so the way i often frame it is there's a few ways to tackle data and ai if you were a uber or facebook google you were early adopters and you that you would essentially be able to brute force it you would hire large large numbers of the smartest engineers and you would build the platform you need in order to you know create a, a knowledge graph or a you know whatever else is required to make your your product sing the next wave of companies taking advantage of data and AI don't have the privilege of being able to hire such huge engineering teams and create all this from scratch. And so instead they turn to companies like Databricks to where we've been able to you know, bottle up that magic, build it into a, into a platform, and they can start building out the things that are most specific to their, you know, to their organization that'll drive the most impact without having to first you know, build the factory. Databricks has done that piece. You can focus on producing the, the whatever's required. The interesting part is that companies of all shapes and sizes benefit from that technology. Some of the really exciting work we're doing is with some of those digital native companies. So the the kind of fangs or mangs plus one, but there are also, you know, large enterprises in healthcare, retail, manufacturing that are also applying this this technology. So I know I'd, I'd love to get more specific, but it, it really is just that broad data and AI is being, being applied everywhere. And where do you see like a typical entry point? And part of the reason I ask is because a big portion of the U.S. economy is driven by small businesses and old fashioned businesses like today I'm getting my air conditioning repaired, right? What does the world look like right now from an advanced analytics perspective for companies like that? So I would say it's rare for a small air conditioning company to be turning to Databricks for data and AI use cases. If you were... There's a bit of a prerequisite here. Okay. For example, if I think of something on the smallest end of town, we were working with a a year and a bit ago now. I was working with a distributor of basically you know fresh food, and they wanted to apply data and AI to you know their their challenge was to 
basically improve their supply chain. So if it's if it's fresh berries that are reaching uh, reaching supermarkets, it's very important to make sure that they get there really quickly. And they wanted to use Databricks to help get there. The challenge for them was they didn't have a single data engineer within their their organization. They were relying on some pretty simple methods. They had some simple Excel spreadsheets, basically, that were, they were using to, to move data around. And it meant that they weren't at the level of maturity that they could actually take advantage of Databricks just yet. So there's a there's kind of a minimum requirement there in order to get in order to get started a basic level of data proficiency which kind of excludes the level of small business that you're describing but as soon as you start to get to the bigger enterprises the the world's your oyster okay got it so i can almost think of it as like if you're big enough to have like a small fpna team you're probably relevant for for a company like databricks absolutely yeah that's probably a good way to cover it and so i guess this might segue us to your previous role at MuleSoft, but curious to, I guess, learn how you got interested in Databricks and value acceleration just in general. The easiest way to explain it would probably be to rewind a little bit because the thread of, of how it happened actually kind of started with the consulting experience. I might skip the, the beginning part and then see how it threads through. But the journey for me was starting with, with AT Kearney as my first uh, job out of university. And I learned the ropes of consulting. So kind of working on tech media telco growth strategy projects, working on you know a lot of process optimization in telco. But in Australia, I was really passionate about tech right from the beginning. I'd listen to the A16Z podcast. I would you know jump on TechCrunch and nerd out about all the, the you know, crazy work that these great innovative tech companies are doing. And the closest I could get to working on those kind of projects from Australia was telco. And so that was where I ended up doubling down, but it, it always kind of, it never quite got to where I would like it to be in terms of the, the nature of the work. The closest I got was like pricing strategy for a telco. Interesting, but not the cutting edge innovation that I was really chasing. So I ended up leaving after a few years of great experience at Kearney and worked on a, a really early stage startup with a couple of, of mates from McKinsey. We're at that for the best part of a year. Didn't turn out quite the way we would like. So I ended up coming back and returning to consulting, this time focused on your know, tech media telco growth strategy firm. It was a, a small firm of like 12 people. Great experience. But again, my challenge was it was just Australia. And so I found I was, I was reaching some limitations there in terms of the, the kind of work I wanted to do. I, I My favorite project was working for a telco. I was seconded as the head of big data to help basically get their big data practice off the ground. And through that, I started learning about a lot of these technologies and learning again that the US is the, the place to really dive in. And so I ended up leaving that consulting firm and came over to the US to hunt for a, an opportunity in tech. And so for me, I wanted to find what was that what was that right stepping off point to go from consulting in order to land in Silicon Valley and, and find that next gig while also learning the, the cultural differences of what how these crazy Americans think. So I had a few challenges all piled up all at once, which we were fun to navigate. We apologize for that, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm engaged to one, so I, I kind of like you guys. <laughs> too late, um, you're, in, you're in too deep. <laughs> I'm in, exactly, exactly. What I concluded was that there are a few areas of interest to me. I really liked the PMM role. So I was speaking to Facebook, Lyft, Uber, Square, Box, a few of these great spots. And so that was one kind of area of investigation. I liked the idea of product management, but I thought that's too far of a leap to get someone to take a chance on a foreigner for their first job in the US and taking a stretch into one of the highest demand roles in Silicon Valley. It was too much to, to do in one go. So I thought, no, nah, let's, let's put a pin in that and see if I can come back to it later. What I ended up stumbling across with first MuleSoft was, yeah, this business value consulting, value engineering role. And what I learned was that it's a really interesting intersection of a lot of the skills that I developed in consulting. The elements around being able to really quickly get up to speed with what what actually matters within an industry, being able to produce the you know, executive ready comms and some models that you can you can defend, and then being able to to communicate and iterate that with some senior folks on the customer side. All of those were skills that I was really familiar with, and the pieces that were the unknown for me were. What does enterprise sales look like? I'd done some you know, projects in that space, but I certainly wasn't an expert. And then what makes a tech company tick? And those were things I really wanted to rub off on me through you know, this experience of moving to the US and working in Silicon Valley. And so that's kind of what, coming back to your original question, that's what kind of led me to this this piece in the first place, this, this kind of role. Does that kind of answer it? I hope so. It does. One other question I now have is, so you just kind of got on a plane and went for it? Yeah. It's, it's, that, that's normal, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, I mean, I guess, and now I'm curious of the story behind the story. You flew to San Francisco. Where did this, I guess, mini adventure kind of go? That was, that turned out to be harder than I expected from the outset. I 
left Australia full of confidence, thinking I'm so employable. I've got this huge passion for tech. I'll be hired in no time. It took seven months, which is longer than I longer than I'd anticipated. And it took two trips because as a uh, on the the appropriate visa, you cannot stay for for too long in in the U.S. before needing to go back to Australia. And I had some real hurdles. I actually found that learning how to sell myself was a big challenge. I knew how to sell myself to to Australians, but Australians, I don't know, they have a reputation of maybe drinking a lot and being pretty friendly, but they don't necessarily have a reputation of, of you know, selling themselves in a corporate environment in Silicon Valley. I needed to, to kind of reinvent myself a little bit. And so I ended up connecting with this community of other Australians that were trying to do the same thing. Surprisingly, there's more than just me. I'm still in touch with, with a lot of them. That community helped. And when I was here and didn't have a job, I had nothing to do other than just find that right fit. And so I was really, really aggressive on LinkedIn, just saying to people, I'd love to, my initial pitch was, I'd love to learn about your career. Basically, here's here's how it worked. I found people on LinkedIn who were working at the companies I was really passionate about and had worked at Bain, McKinsey or BCG before they got there. I'm like, those are my people. Nice. And just reached out, had conversations with them. That was it. I said to them, can I shout you a coffee? I'd love to hear about your career. Well, that was all it was. You don't get many, many characters when you send out a, a LinkedIn message cold like that. And I was really, really pleased with how many people actually responded positively. I didn't realize that everyone gets free food. They don't really care about being shouted a coffee. Americans have pretty rubbish coffee anyway. So it turned out they just invited me to their office. We'd often have a few of their free snacks or something or other, and then and we'd get to know one another that way. But I found that was a really good way for me to understand these roles. And then eventually it led, basically people tended to work out, okay, this guy kind of knows what he's talking about enough for them to at least make a referral, which of course helped me get to the, the top of the pile for the, the applications for the jobs. Well, and then you also learn about what you want to do and what, equally important you don't want to do, right? Absolutely. And what, yeah, what I want to do and and the chances of me being employed in any one of these roles. I was acutely aware that I needed to just make that first step. The two offers that I ended up getting at the conclusion of that process were a consulting firm that I would have absolutely loved to join, Altman Valandry, with a San Francisco-based role. It was a telco media tech company. I'm I'm still in touch with a couple of the partners there. Had a really good experience. And the other, the role I I was offered was this, you know, business value consulting, kind of like this value acceleration role, but at MuleSoft. And I figured, you know what, let's now have an opportunity to work in one of these tech companies. I I really wanted to see that one through. So that ended up being my, my first step in the U.S., and I'll, I'll clarify that I made sure I was very on top of the correct visas to make sure that all of this works. It's atypical for someone to, to do it this way. So I, I was extra careful in making sure that I you know, ticked all those boxes. That's right. And so now you, you find yourself at MuleSoft. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about kind of what MuleSoft does and I guess your role there as well? Yeah, for sure. So MuleSoft is basically an integration platform. So for for companies that want to make connections between different systems, for example, if you want your Salesforce CRM to connect to your Oracle ERP, you'd need to make, build those connections so that data can flow through in in the appropriate speed and cadence and all that stuff. And so MuleSoft offers a solution to do just that. The role that I had there was, is really similar to this, to this role that I have here, which is, you know, I, I had a smaller kind of patch to cover. I covered a few different regions within the US and I was really closely linked to the performance of the field. So if they closed deals, I would end up earning some commissions. And so I ended up being able to cover a really wide variety of, of companies. So similar to, to consulting, it kind of appealed, being able to jump from organization to organization and learn them, learn these how these crazy Americans think, work with some New York sellers, work with some in Chicago, work right across the right across the country. Uh, yeah, essentially work out, work out what this specialized role looks like. And I, I found that that has now helped me in the, in a leadership role at Databricks. I've seen some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't work at MuleSoft and I've now been able to apply those as well as kind of drawing on the experience of my boss and my mentor here at Databricks, Doug May, absolutely brilliant. Um, I think all of those elements have really helped piece together what comes after the, yeah, basically the MuleSoft to Databricks switch. Excellent. And so, okay, so to summarize that, so you want to go from consulting to technology. It sounds like you did a few things. So, so the first thing that you mentioned is you sort of geeked out like you went down the YouTube and podcast rabbit hole to just learn everything that, that you have no clue about. Two, you decided to get on a on a plane for, for yep. God knows why and just <laughs> and just figure it out, which we can argue about the uh, the the approach, but it's worked. <laughs> it worked. And then three, which I think is not a minor point, which is 
you just reached out to some folks and said, hey, I, I want to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting because a lot of the folks that I see in consulting now, they tell me, oh, but uh, I looked at this company and there's no, there's no jobs available. And I feel like they've shot themselves in the foot before they've even started. How do you overcome, I guess, like that? I don't want to call it fear or just how do you quiet the voice inside your head that says this might be a huge waste of time? I think it's I think a lot of consultants I've worked with have this great curiosity. And if you put yourself in the shoes of the, the person that you're reach, you might, may think to reach out to that could help you understand this. If they're anything like me, they're very appreciative of the people that help to get them there. So, and a discussion with someone that's curious, engaging, intelligent, and and you're motivated to to understand and, and make the next make the next move. I have time for for people like that, and I hope I I've seen others that help me that certainly had time for it as well. I'd squash those those negative thoughts by saying, look, there's either one of two kinds of people: either they're they're willing and open to to help. Or they're not the kind of person you want to be getting advice from and connections with anyway. So if they say yes, great, have a chat. If they say no, that's probably not a, or they're silent, that's probably not a bad thing either. You'll get enough of the positive responses to make it a worthwhile effort. Okay. No, that I think that's good for the listeners to hear because bringing it really full circle here, Gavin, is I didn't know Gavin before basically getting acquainted through this, this podcast, but... I have a similar approach with with guests. Now, a lot of them are friends, but uh, a lot of them are folks that uh, it's just an area that our listeners have said, "Hey, we want to learn about this," and I try to and I try to get those guests on the show. So I've had a similar experience in that uh, I'm continuously surprised, actually, at the willingness and openness of folks to just kind of share what what they know with with, uh, with me and, and and with our listeners. So that's great. Definitely, it was a bit of a. a an interesting point for me coming straight to the U S and not really being sure what the, what that culture will be like, especially given, at least from my, I feel like Australia is like a country town compared to, to coming to, to SF. And I saw this like bravado. There's this big energy and I don't want to say arrogance, but there's a lot of confidence behind a lot of these Americans that work in these really interesting positions doing this great work. I wasn't sure if that would also be combined with a, you know, I'm looking out for myself. I'm going to be a bit of a jerk to you when, when you reach out. That is not what I found. Instead, I found that while these people are, uh, you know, have big personalities and they're, they're working hard, they're, they're doing great things, they also got there through the help of others. And so they're more, much more open than I expected. I was really pleasantly surprised. That's a funny point because I don't know if it's like the accent, but I, I will say, I, and I can't speak for everybody in America, but I, when I, at least when I started my career, I was very intimidated by folks from like the UK or Australia. It's like, I was just like, wow, they, 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 they sound very confident, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I got in an Uber in, uh, in San Francisco. I, I loved the, the sharing Ubers back before COVID when you can actually do that. Cause I made yeah. loads of friends and every single person I sat next to, even the, even the Uber drivers, they had their own startup, like they're doing something big. And I found, I don't know if you have to bleep it, but I found that when I got to America, my bullshit meter was off. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell if someone was actually going to be the next Bill Gates or if they were just doing, they weren't going to get there at all. And it took me a while to recalibrate. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, definitely some, some cultural differences, but I think just, yeah, assuming people are going to be helpful is probably a good way to operate. Absolutely. And actually it's funny you mentioned the Uber share rides because I used to love that. And so our office is in LA and I used to do the same thing. And instead of you know, replace startup with actor. Right. And so then like yeah. you'd hear the story. And then like, as soon as I got out of the Uber, I'd be Googling this person. Right. Like, it's like it turns out they're not as famous as, you know, they've projected themselves to be, but no. my, my bullshit meter was off too. And we don't need to bleep anything here. Perfect. Glad to hear it. It's free reign. Excellent. <laughs> well, I think that's quite a journey, Gavin. Appreciate you sharing that. I guess we'd love to just kind of like transition kind of more high level what advice do you have for folks that are maybe in consulting and looking to get into tech or, or SaaS or, or maybe even a startup just in general? Yeah, I've got a few, a few bits of advice. There was one thing that really came to me when I was first doing the, the exercise of marketing myself to these different roles. I'll give you an example. I interviewed for a, a product marketing manager role at Box. And when I looked at the, the position description and the way that, you know, they needed people that could translate between technical needs and business needs and the whole role, essentially, I just thought I've done that time and time again, but in a consulting setting and I would be a perfect fit for that role. And so when I put forward my, my CV, I'm like, yeah, I'm a shoe in for this. When I got in front of the hiring manager, all my assumptions 
were, I had to throw out the window. The hiring manager for that particular role had no idea what a management consultant does. They certainly didn't understand the nuance of a strategic management consultant. If you're doing your growth strategy work versus more of an implementation style, you know, IT consultant, there, there was certainly none of that nuance. And they barely really understood how the consulting skill set would apply to that role. That was a bit of an eye opener for me. And, and once I kind of internalized it, I realized I needed to do a much better job of actually selling my experience and matching it to the role that I had in front of me. It was something that wasn't immediately obvious that I even needed to do. I, I thought my CV spoke for itself. No, it turns out that's not the case. So I would certainly encourage folks to be thinking that through, at least for me at first. I needed a few friendly folks that were friends that were already you know in these spots or I'd reached out to through LinkedIn to actually take a look at my CV and take a look at the role that I'm thinking of applying to and help giving me some guidance of how I could actually improve the match. Luckily for me, I got better at it pretty quickly, but at first it was really rough. So I would encourage you to kind of acknowledge that especially within tech, folks don't necessarily understand the consulting consulting role or how great the skills are a fit for these jobs. Absolutely. And that can vary by position as well as company type within tech, right? So product manager for one company might be an entirely different role than it is for another company. And by the way, have an entirely different kind of like skill set required, a technical PM versus a non-technical PM, right? There's all sorts of variations there. Great, great point. Anything else? I sound like you, you had more. Yeah, I've got, I've got a few, I've got a few that'll be helpful. I'm hoping. So, so that was a, that was a big one for, for me to begin with. I would also encourage folks to be thinking through the role that is likely to be the, the best fit. The ones that I'd learned through, you know, tons of conversations and, and questions, the, the, the place that I first thought, the kind of role I first thought I would be getting into in tech coming from consulting was like a strategy or biz ops role of the one Australian, my good mate, Nikki Lou, she'd managed to, to come over to the US and work at Google in a biz ops role. And so I was, I, I was like, great, that's, that's probably the one that I'm after. What I actually learned was that only a few of the largest, most mature tech companies actually have that role. Uber had it, Google had it, there were a handful like that, but it was, I only really realized afterwards that my thinking of where consultants go after consulting in Australia, which is, there aren't that many options. You go to one of the big banks or one of the big telcos and you work in their strategy team. That doesn't work in tech. There, there isn't a centralized like strategy function that you can typically just parachute into. Uh, unless you're going for the bigger, more mature companies. And so that forced me to then think, I don't want to go for the, the, the bigger ones. I actually want something that's growing faster. I want, the, I want that growth experience because I think a lot of opportunity comes from it. And so it ended up pushing me away from that initial role. And that's what led me to those two roles that I was, I was really narrowing in on. The, the product marketing manager, PMM. So that was at, at a Facebook or I think that was the box role as well. That one was a good fit because it kind of married together the consulting skills and the tech and product piece, which I really liked. I saw it as a potential gateway to product manager. And then separately in the enterprise sales space, this business value consulting or value engineering role seemed like to, it could be a really good fit. And so I guess that on that second piece, the, the point there is, yeah, think through and explore what those roles could be. Hopefully I've given you a few shortcuts there in terms of what worked for me, but yeah, certainly worth considering. No, that's great. And one of the other, I'd say, central themes of kind of Gavin, if you will, is it's super impressive that I guess throughout this kind of like experience or transition from Australia to the, to the States or consulting to tech, you've managed to hit on something which is important and that is let me actually think about how the person on the other side of the table is picking this up right and i think that's something that like at least i completely missed in consulting right it was like okay i'm here to do this project i'm going to do this project and now i'm done and now what project am i on next and it, it really yes. was all about me and then as i got kind of further in my career i realized i i don't matter <laughs> like <laughs> I'm, I'm being a little kind of funny on purpose. But the reality is like, if I'm going to work with clients, if I'm going to work with candidates, I actually need to understand kind of what, what matters to them and what are their objectives. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's had such an impact in terms of kind of like why you've been successful uh, in in the role that you're in now at, at Databricks. I think if you don't know, a really interesting part of the journey, and I, I can credit a lot of it to understanding how salespeople think. When I was in, uh, when I was a consultant, I used to think sales was a bit of like a dirty word. It's not the kind of thing I'd thing I'd want to be doing or the place I'd be want to, want to be working. But my my boss Doug, as I called out earlier, he rose through the ranks as a as a salesperson, a sales manager, and now into a leader of this this value acceleration practice globally. 
and he very much is, I mean, we have complementary skills. The he I can probably produce a, a prettier slide deck, although these are pretty pretty these days. But his empathy for the team, his empathy for the for the folks that we're selling to in order to, to make them successful, the way he you know thinks about long-term growth of of, of people and the, the others within our organization, all of those things were lessons that I wasn't even aware that I needed to learn. And so it was a big part of, I would say, of, of my success has been, yes, thinking about the person on the other side of the of the table, but then also I've been fortunate enough to come across a mentor who is invested in my success and willing and able to, to kind of teach me and show me the the some of these things to drive longer term, yeah, long term success in tech. So again, I don't know if you need to hit all of these these uh, points all at once, but it's certainly something that's helped me in my career. No, that's a really great point, especially around like just I hear you on sales in the past being a bit of a dirty word. And especially now we're even seeing consultants go into sales roles uh, for the exact mm-hmm. reasons that you're talking about. It's a, it's a more complex sale. Empathy is required, right? It's not just kind of explaining the features and benefits and hoping that they'll sign on the dotted line. Thanks for sharing that. Of course. And just lastly, Gavin, because we are all a bunch of nerdy consultants at mm-hmm. the core, we're slowly developing a, a library of books that uh, we recommend to uh, our listeners. Just curious if there's any books that have had a big impact on your career or life. Absolutely. So I was thinking about this one before I jumped on, you know, lining up with our, our you know, enterprise sales theme. I think there are a couple of great sales books that are worth a look. Spin Selling and Never Split the Difference are two of my favorites. But one that actually jumped in before I'd, I'd gone down this path when I was back as a consultant that really changed my perspective was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it sounds like, again, it sounds almost manipulative in the title, but the big takeaway for me from that book was just that the way to build gen, like build rapport with folks and, and build lasting connections is to show genuine interest in them. And it's not that hard if you actually have you know a curiosity and this goal to make connections with folks. So yeah, that book is kind of what got me thinking along those lines. I love that. And I noticed you mentioned spin selling, which I'm also a huge fan of. It's especially helpful in you know, a, a solution selling, right? Definitely. And for those listeners, I promise that even though it's a bad ac- it's a bad acronym, it doesn't mean like you're not trying to put a spin on on anything. It's it's actually just an acronym. Which, if I recall correctly, Gavin, it's what is it's situation, problem, implications, and then need payoff. Yeah, I think you got it. Nice. It's just a structure to think about selling. But I like Dale Carnegie's book as well. So. Gavin, really appreciate you joining the the podcast. Um, If folks want to learn a little bit more about Databricks, where should they look? So I would, I mean, find me on LinkedIn and you can learn through Databricks that way. I I must say that given my my background is in in consulting, I really value this this skill set. I see how well it applies to, you know, this value acceleration role and and to this this industry and and applying it to, to tech. I think that while I described, you know, us helping, helping on commercial deals directly, there's actually a bigger picture that the value team at Databricks impacts, which is we help to you know, up-level the way that Databricks sells. We spot problems in the way that we go to market and we actively come up with solutions and then help to scale them. And I think that's something that a consulting mind, a consulting problem solver is, is pretty uniquely positioned to do really, really well. And so I've in the past actively reached out to folks that are currently in consulting roles and have a passion for tech in order to attract them to Databricks. If there are folks that are passionate about breaking it into tech and they have the consulting background, I'd love to hear from them. So yeah, LinkedIn me. I think that'd be free. That'd be brilliant. There you have it, guys. An open invitation. So it's, it won't even be a cold outreach uh, like Gavin exactly. had to do. So, <laughs> well, no, thanks. Thanks for doing that. And we'll also just include your company website in the podcast description. And uh, for, for those of you listening for the first time, uh, make sure to subscribe and like us on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon so that you're notified of future episodes. And lastly, if you're uh, interested in learning more about the podcast or want to become a guest, uh, it's beyondconsulting.info. And then lastly, uh, if you want to get in touch with me directly or anybody at my firm, it's going to be eca-partners.com. And you can just navigate to the team page and you got all our contact information there. Gavin, thanks so much for joining. Uh, Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, for everyone else, look forward to talking to you next week. Cheers, Ken. Appreciate it. Mm